is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Welcome to the second day of the 25th AMIC Annual Conference. On behalf of the Miriam College community, we welcome you to our home and we hope that you are enjoying your stay with us. Good morning to all our honored guests, speakers, presenters, delegates, and participants. As yesterday's plenary and parallel sessions were all very enriching and enlightening, rest assured that today's sessions will be equally engaging and stimulating. To open today's activities, we are privileged to have as our keynote speaker a well-respected and renowned communicator in Asia. He was formerly a secretary of the Ministry of Information and Communications in Bhutan. Before that, he was managing director and editor-in-chief of Quinsel, Bhutan's national newspaper. He is a strong proponent of gross national happiness, also known as GNH, as an alternative model for human development. He currently lives in Timpu with his wife and three children. He graduated from Mitchell College in New South Wales, Australia, and the Journalism School of Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all warmly welcome Dasha Kinley Gorgi. Good morning, everyone. As everyone says, the, uh, I was uh, talking to my wife last evening, and uh, she says, I mean, you on an island where almost everyone can get up and sing and dance and perform at the drop of a hat, and you're going to talk about happiness. <laughs> so it's, uh, in that sense, a bit intimidating. So I, uh, I decided that my talk should be called Happiness is no laughing matter. I don't guarantee to make any of you happier at the end of the talk, but perhaps I can confuse you a little bit. Um, the, my talk is gross national happiness, as uh, you know, Dr. Ray said yesterday. The, the gross national happiness is a debate that is picking up internationally. And, uh, it is, but what I would say that uh, this debate really is an exchange of perceptions, people's perceptions on happiness. We know that uh, you know intellectual giants have been talking about happiness over the centuries, and, and nobody, we still don't have a common understanding of happiness. You ask, you ask, talk to ten people, and you get fifteen different uh, interpretations. So I'm going to I'm going to talk largely on the. Uh, in Bhutan's context, what gross national happiness is, and obviously this kind of this topic, which is very profound uh, uh, for me, to try and sum it up in uh, 30 minutes, I'm going to just uh, try and explain what GNH happiness, gross national happiness, means to us in Bhutan. Okay. I want to be very careful that we. Uh, I don't want to give the impression we are happier than we actually are. Bhutan is a developing country with the challenges which all of uh, faced by all developing countries. We're dealing with youth education, unemployment, uh, social problems, including suicides now, rural urban migration, and uh, and then of course globalization, which is like an aerial and digital invasion uh, these days. So I'll talk more about uh, the background. The term gross national happiness was first uh, 
announced in uh, 1979 when the King of Bhutan, the fourth King of Bhutan was interviewed in India by some Indian journalists. They said that look, we are the closest neighbor and we know nothing about Bhutan. For example, what's your gross national product? You might all uh, remember that before GDP, it used to be GNP, gross national product. So the king said, no, uh, actually gross national happiness is more important to us than gross national product. Okay, so that, these words really now have become historic and uh, I'll, I'm going to try and explain that. Uh, we really have to look at the, uh, you know, the geo... This is a Bhutan situation, but I think it's relevant to, to most countries. We look at now the geopolitical situation. We are half a little more than half a million people between India and China. Okay, 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion people. So this is us as a small society with a very strong sense of vulnerability, but uh, I would call the threat, threat perception of a small state, small country. So what Bhutan did because of this, by policy, we decided to survive by hiding in the mountains. So that's why very little is known about uh, Bhutan. And that's why we have this image, very mystical image, the last Shangri-La, the hidden kingdom. And, and well, it kind of works for us because uh, tourists are now willing to pay $250 to see this mystical kingdom. Um, in the, you know, with, uh, with time in the 1960s, Bhutan opened up to so-called, the so-called development process. Yes. We were one of the last countries. By then, the world had gone through about four decades of this so-called, uh, of, of development. And we, with the advantage of hindsight, we saw that the world interpreted development purely as economic development, material development. Okay. It was a kind of pursuit of uh, material wealth. And uh, that's when we were, we looked around and we thought oh, there were countries that had become rich, but not, societies were not necessarily happy. So, so that, and then uh, Bhutan was able to say, look around and say, okay, that you know, human development needs a higher goal and therefore it should be uh, happiness, you know, not just economic development. And it was also helped by you know, societies that had uh, you know, number of scholars, people are coming from countries like Japan and all now to look at, uh, to see what this is all about. That, uh, countries that have achieved GDP but find something missing. Um, so gross national happiness in that sense is a fun from gross national product. The whole message is that we have to go beyond GDP, GNP. The GDP, GNP are broken promises by now. Um, the, so we were able to, in that sense, uh, you know, use, turn this late start into an advantage. And uh, I'd like to quickly then talk about gross national happiness. I, you know, I cringe to think of uh, when I hear people saying that, oh, you know, this uh, happy country, happy people, uh, tell us how, please make us happy, tell us about happiness. But uh, in this context today, I'll, I'll be a little pro provocative and talk about and uh, talk on the premise that yes, we do have a level of cross national happiness. So, what is cross national happiness? Um, it's not it's not a kind of a sudden enlightenment, but it's really the expression of values of the past that we because we remain in self-imposed isolation we were able to preserve a mixture of good leadership and good fortune. That we had these uh, values when many countries around us had lost them. So I want to describe uh, this cross-national happiness uh, in four different stages. And this is my own personal uh, interpretation and understanding. The first is what I call the intuitive happiness. And this is something which I think all of us, all Asian countries and others, of course, would be familiar with you know, the rural societies, communities of the past that lived in interdependence. Uh, communities like we have a rural village with uh, the rural healer, carpenter, uh, singer, you know, uh, dancer, monk, preacher. So, community, a community where people helped each other. 
the, uh, the perhaps the difference in Bhutan is that uh, this interdependence goes beyond the human community to the all life forms, the environment, the natural environment, wildlife, trees, plants, that uh, the intuitive uh, uh, understanding that we are more dependent on nature than nature is on us. So that the, the respect for life forms. So, but that we also know with so-called development is changing. Then, uh, and that's the next stage would be that once Bhutan, once we start talking about cross-national happiness, we are fortunately being challenged. You know, the development workers, international organizations, including all the UN agencies, saying, okay, so if you're talking about happiness, what is that? GNA, what is it? Is going to be a goal for development? How do you measure it? And how do you explain it? So we were in that sense forced to do a little more thinking, some academic instruction around this uh, concept. So in short, how I understand it is that, that happiness we know in a partly spiritual influence that lies within the self. Uh, there's no external source of happiness. The uh, faster car, bigger house, uh, nicer clothes, etc. does not give you that, uh, that happiness. And this, this, we explain it, the King of Bhutan when he first mentioned it, explained happiness as contentment. It's a long-term abiding sense of contentment. Contentment with what you have. Not the Disneyland happiness, not dream world, not, uh, not even singing and dancing to an extent, yeah. but that uh, uh, permanent sense of contentment. So then, the, uh, which means that we accept this, uh, this is a contentment which lies within the self. So then we move to the next stage where then it became the responsibility of the state, the government, to create the conditions, that's what we say. Uh, governments, we know, do not make people happy necessarily. They're some very often better at making people unhappy. But uh, the so this became this a sense a responsibility of the state, we say, to create the conditions where citizens can pursue happiness. It's not a guarantee of happiness for the government. It's not a promise of happiness, but it's a responsibility. So that's where the government of Bhutan, to create those conditions, define the four pillars of happiness. That is, that's uh, you know, the sustainable, equitable economic development. Because it's not, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not against economic development. But we say that uh, it needs to be more holistic. So it's uh, equitable economic development, uh, preservation of the environment, preservation of culture, and good governance. So these are the four pillars, which were expanded into nine domains. I'm not going to all the details. And the nine domains further into indicators, where we do this, uh, where we do the survey, GNA survey, as it's uh, becoming popularly known. So that's why we say that in this case, uh, happiness is a serious business. Happiness is no laughing matter, as, uh, as someone said. Um, you know, the, uh, we, what we find, this is the difference, because in many countries, about 40 countries have now claimed that they've adopted cross-national happiness. But I think most of these are from, uh, with NGOs, you know, civil society, people doing very good work, but looking for, uh, you know, something to hang on to. And, uh, and something, they, this, the term GNA, the concept seems to give these organizations some comfort. But I think many, in many countries, they're still on the fringes. In Bhutan, the difference is it's a responsibility, you know, it's a mandate given to the government. Then uh, the next stage, internationalization of cross-national happiness. And this is the, uh, this is the international discourse that has uh, picked up. I would be, I would hasten to add that it's not, uh, it's not, Bhutan is not in a position to go out and teach happiness or preach GNA. But, you know, take part in this discourse. And, you know, the, yesterday also someone talked about the SDGs. I mean, we are all signatories to the SDGs. The, after the MDGs uh, of the UN 2015, when the world was kind of discussing what next, 
you know, Bhutan has also asked to do a, uh, a kind of a development alternative paradigm. I was involved in uh, the discussions. And looking around, what I saw was that when we talk about these four pillars, the world has actually done more work uh, on these four pillars, on at least three pillars, like environment, because of global warming and uh, you know, there's climate change and all that, there's so much uh, scientific work done, which we could pick up, which say a country like Bhutan is not capable of. The um, good governance, especially with ICT now, you know, smart cities, smart countries, smart governance, interactive governance, and all that. So there's a lot we learn again from the outside. Of course, uh, in terms of the sustainable uh, economic development, you know, what's closest to the conventional interpretation of uh, development, the uh, again we would pick up like uh, like infrastructure moving on to the information age, you know, there's much we could learn. What is interesting, I think, is that uh, culture seems to be neglected. It seems to be completely overlooked. There's not much emphasis on culture at all. And I thought uh, that, was a, that was a pity. And that in, in this, in this uh, kind of global discourse, that this is something that we could GNA to emphasize. We actually did take it to the uh, UN, but uh, culture, the SDGs, the 17 SDGs which someone mentioned yesterday, actually neglects culture again. That uh, may be one of the challenges. And that's why in, when we talk about SDGs, we are talking about putting SDGs into the concept, in the context of cross-national happiness, so that we have these uh, priorities. In the, what have we actually done so to try and uh, Make it uh, to connect it with media communication. I didn't go into detail in some of this because I think the next session is going to come with uh, is going to go a little more in depth into the Asian religion and philosophies and communication. But what we did try in uh, in Bhutan was also to get the media community because the media were actually quite skeptical, saying, "Okay, again, GNH, you want us to you know, with." We have journalism to work on rather than just write about environment and culture, etc. But uh, but the approach, our approach really was, it's not what media writes about happiness, but what is the responsibility of media, of journalists, of professionals in a society that claims to be a GNA society? So, what should the priorities be? What should the what are the values? If uh, if uh, in an identity is the shared consciousness of the people in different parts of a country, which is really established by media. The uh, picking up on this uh, imagined community, imagined community by Anderson, Benedict Anderson, and the whole idea of the media, uh, you know, creating the shared consciousness and shared values. When people listen to the same. Uh, you know, radio program, watch the same TV program, read the same newspapers, and pick up values. And at a time, when a lot of even in Bhutan, a lot of the young people, the sense of uh, humor, you know, clothing style, etc., is picked up from Bollywood and Hollywood. So, so how do you, within the country, how do you define and create those values and uh, and well, so instill? Because in, a, in developing countries, I think we all know the media has an important role of uh, education. Sometimes, well, force, even forcing people to think. So we say that media must be part of this uh, experiment. And uh, story. Some of the some of the points. I just noted a few bullet points. You know, that uh, many journalists write stories for themselves rather than the society or for the people, for the audience. Um, and this is something I was saying that we would uh, go into a little more in depth later. Uh, media being sensitive to the society, of the society they're working in. Um, when global media is contributing to so much unhappiness, consumerism, uh, commercial, commercialization, sensationalism, you know, then with uh, social media, hate speech, etc. Can we treat uh, the audience as people rather than consumers? It's not a new concept. I think it's been it's been around for some time. Um, and just as media needs to hold uh, government accountable, 
media must be accountable to the people, you know, to the readers, viewers, listeners, and uh, it just as also state, what we say, in a small country, the state must invest in media. Media should also emphasize investment in professionalism, training, etc., rather than just uh, people. We even went to the stage where we're trying, in terms of advertising, it's uh, unusually uh, in Bhutan, the largest advertiser is the government. So I was involved in a government advertising guideline, you know, saying that, okay, we will, without being, without trying, pressuring media, let's, we will give adver advertisements to media that are conscious of values. And it was actually easier to define uh, what is not GNH media than to define GNH media. So we're saying, okay, so media that don't advertise uh, alcohol, tobacco, even junk food, let's go to that extent. And media that talk about education, health, will advertise them. So that was one strategy, hasn't entirely worked, but that was the approach. And media help people make good decisions. So the basic message of my uh, brief statement really is that in this rethinking communication in the research in Asia, that uh, when you talk about the value, we have looked everywhere, we've looked particularly largely at the West, but have we looked uh, back, have we looked back at our own societies, at our own histories, at the values that have existed? Now the world is talking about sustainability, but we've actually been talking. Uh, talking about sustainability for more than 100 years in, uh, in every sense. So I thought that I would keep my address to this uh, brief introduction and we would be very happy to uh, take questions if there are any. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So the questions come later. I will not, uh, I will uh, not go into detail. We're very happy to discuss with anyone who's interested in this, but I thought this brief introduction is what I would like to do this morning. Thank you very much. of Bhutan on the source, the core, and the means of sustaining happiness.